so now I'm, we're now transport yourself uh, roughly 50 miles to the south to San Francisco, sister city, San Jose. We're a city of a million people, and I'm going to talk about our experience uh, designing government services in San Jose. It's actually extremely uh, cathartic and inspirational to hear uh, what our partners in San Francisco are doing because there's a lot we can learn from them. So I'm going to cover a little bit about what it means to be ooh, doing design in local government. Uh, I'll share some lessons that we've learned on our 311 app. Uh, talk a little bit about how we measure progress and end on why this work matters. Uh, so what it means to design in local government. Uh, this is especially for those of you who um, may not have exposure to the public sector. Um, but also there, there's some stuff in here that's always good for uh, me to center on to remember the scale of our task, uh, which, which Carrie portrayed uh, very eloquently as well. So the first thing to think about is that while local governments are the smallest government agencies in, in the United States, so between you know, federal, state, we are responsible for a staggering range of services given the size of our agencies. Um, and in San, Ho San Jose, this runs the gamut, everything from uh, making sure that 11 and a half million airport passengers are transported safely um, to the care and feeding of 178 zoo animals at Happy <laughs> Hollow Park and Zoo, which my four-year-old daughter loves to go to, to learn about the ring-tailed lemur. <laughs> I mean, so, so that's a huge range. And in between that, there's everything from uh, library services, handling po police emergency calls, uh, processing 38,000 building permits a year, filling potholes, managing fires, and dozens of others uh, that I haven't listed here, and many which we haven't even counted, because uh, San Francisco's ahead of, of, of us there, and I'm going to talk to Persis afterwards about how she managed to count 800 <laughs> plus services. And how this reflects in our org structure is that we have a staff of over 6,000 employees in the city of San Jose, and they have a diverse skill set ranging from uh, police and firefighters, to park rangers and recreation class leaders, um, to transportation planners. Um, and this red dot represents uh, the Office of Civic Innovation and Digital Strategy, where we have uh, roughly 10 positions, only four are permanent, uh, and the other six are temporary. And out of those, uh, only about three of us would really consider ourselves designers. So that's like the, the task that's ahead of us when we think about we're going to design government services with all of these government services. We're going to redesign them and make them better, but you know, with whom and how. And so that translates into a couple things uh, that I think are maybe true in other organizations for designers, but are certainly true in local government. Um, that as a designer, you will spend a lot of time explaining what design is uh, and why it's valuable. Um, if you tell someone, when my team members say, I'm a content designer, immediately afterwards they have to have you know, their 30 second elevator pitch of what it means to be a content designer because the other folks they're meeting with who run parks programs or manage stormwater wouldn't know what that means. Um, you also spend a lot of time thinking about how to facilitate epiphany moments for your government colleagues to observe users uh, and shift their thinking from their organizational-centric perspective to a user-centric perspective. Um, and ultimately, to like, get to like, ship your design improvements into the real world, you're often supporting the staff members who own the service delivery. Uh, you're supporting them and coaching them to take design-led approaches. And here's, uh, here's a few examples of how we're doing those things in San Jose. So um, our team did not have the benefit of having a digital services strategy before we started that gave us a clear mandate. We kind of just started building, and that was sort of how we went from digital services being kind of an imaginary title and idea that I applied to myself and then kept repeating <laughs> and doing things until it became a sort of a more real thing. Um, and so we started, so another thing about government is that you have to be somewhat opportunistic about how you get started in terms of figuring out where do we have 
um, the right level of uh, executive championship and stakeholder buy-in, that's a big factor in what you start with. So um, while we were very interested in the city's website, what we started with was our 311 reporting app. Uh, has anyone here used the 311 reporting app before? 311 reporting apps are kind of like the bread and butter of local government service delivery. Um, they're used by residents to report neighborhood issues like potholes and graffiti. Um, and for some residents, they can be a really crucial link to feeling like government is, local government is there for them. Like if they report graffiti and the next day it's gone, they're like, wow, that was magic. Like government really works. Um, but there's lots of times when we don't follow through and they're like, oh yeah, government, what do you expect? Um, so it turns out in San Jose, one in 20 San Jose residents has a registered account and we get about 500 requests a day, which are handled by over 50 different staff uh, across five different departments. And they all have their own different back end work order management systems. Um, so looking back on it, the 311 app probably wasn't the simplest service we could have started with. Um, oh, by the way, it's also, it's a, there's, there's a call center that takes in requests. There's also live chat. Uh, we have a web portal for a reporting requests, and we also have like a mobile app. So pre a pretty complex ecosystem to get started in, uh, but we've learned a lot. Um, so this is our pilot uh, central di digital services team. I'm the product owner for our 311 app. Uh, this is our user experience designer, content designer, and we have a product manager. We don't actually have developers in-house. All of our development work is done by uh, contractors, which adds another layer of complexity because we can iterate if you set up the contracts right, but, but when you run out of money on that contract or you have to go out for procurement, that's like a whole nother multi-year obstacle potentially. Um, and it's not just about our team. So I mentioned the like six different service delivery teams across five different departments. Um, this is like our decision making and delivery org chart for our 311 app. And we had to establish that governance structure. Um, if it makes your eyes hurt or your stomach churn, like that's okay, but this is like the reality. So this is like my team and me and the product owner and the product manager, the product owner and the product manager here. But we really need to be working with the service owners for abandoned vehicles, graffiti, illegal dumping, potholes, street lights, and general requests. And each of these people is in a different department with their own chain of hierarchy. And so, you know, it was a big step for us to get the executives, the directors of all these departments in our room and for my executive sponsors to say like, okay, Michelle is the product owner. She's gonna like take all our input and set priorities and then the service owners, like your staff and your chain of command should be following the priorities and the direction set by this entire team. So we're trying to cut across those uh, department like hierarchies and, and cut across those silos. And that's uh, new and uncomfortable for our organization because local governments are very hierarchical and they're not used to, you know, cross silo collaboration that doesn't go all the way up the chain for its blessing. Um, one of the things that we're doing now that we have that is we're applying service design standards to our services. So this was like when we got that structure together and we decided on our objective that we were gonna use objectives and key results to drive priorities across the departments, we were like, well, where do we start? Um, good timing. Uh, some wonderful folks from the UK, uh, Lou is quoted here, had set out 15 principles of good service design. And one of the ones that we honed in on as something that was obviously lacking was a good service must set expectations a user has of it. When we got to the My San Jose, My San Jose is the name of our 311 app. When we got to it, users won't be, weren't being told how long the process takes. So you see a couch dumped on your street corner, you take a photo of it, you submit it, um, to the city and then we would just say, thanks for your request. We wouldn't say, you're gonna hear back in a day, you're gonna hear back in three weeks. Sometimes like people would be completely amazed because a car, a truck would then come by later that afternoon and take it away and they'd be like, that's amazing. The next time they do it though, it might like take weeks before they even heard, you know, yes, we, we 
received it and were assigning staff. So we weren't doing a good job of setting expectations. What we had to do, and this goes back to the governance, was get all the service teams to agree on the fact that like, yes, we should be setting expectations about turnaround times. That means we need to decide, we need to be hold, set a standard that we can meet and hold ourselves accountable to it. Um, and so it sounds very basic from a service standard perspective, like of course we should be setting expectations. But getting the teams and the departments to be like, okay, we are going to tell them how long it should take and then they'll know if we're taking longer than we should. That was scary for them and it often did go all the way up to the chain to the department director to say like, yes, it is okay for us to say that it will usually take us five business days. <laughs> and so that's what you're saying here. So like, this was big progress. I mean, it's not technically hard. It's not amazing from a design standpoint. There's one sentence we added to the confirmation pop-up. We usually resolve illegal dumping requests within five days. But that was a step forward for us in San Jose to get our services to start meeting service design stan standards of good service design. Thank you. Another thing we found is that, you know, we get the best traction, especially as you're starting out, when you find opportunities to solve for both residents and staff. Um, I think perhaps in, in a private sector environment, providing a good user experience can also be justified in that you will get more customers and therefore more revenue. Um, in the city of San Jose, for our 311 app, if you tell people we're going to make it even easier for people to, rep to, to report for feeder illegal dumping, <laughs> directors will freak out at you because they'll say, my staff cannot handle more work, we're already overburdened, like don't do this to us, like don't make it easier for residents. <laughs> and it's not that they, it's, they don't mean that, they're not trying to provide bad customer service or a bad customer experience, they just, don't feel like they're set up for success. So what we need to do is to understand what are those pain points for our staff in being set up, having the processes and the systems to support them and kind of find the sweet spot where we can meet um, both the residents' needs as well as, as our internal staff needs so they are set up for success. Um, and that's how we get, uh, can make progress on organizing for end-to-end -end service delivery. Um, because one of the things that's really hard about starting with a 311 service is you can't get away from like the physical aspect of the service delivery. When someone reports illegal dumping, um, there's then someone in an office who's triaging that request and then eventually folks have to drive out in a truck that's size big enough to pick up whatever that trash is and take it somewhere. Um, so there's a lot of physical reality 180 square miles of city that you have to grapple with um, beyond just like the interaction that the user has on the screen. Um, and one of the other things that we've realized is that when we turn uh, picking up couches on the sidewalk into a digital service, we didn't change the staffing. So these folks who are reporting, they now have customer facing uh, roles in that actions that they take, messages that they issue from their back end are going back to the customer. And they didn't see themselves as that. They think my job is to fill the pothole, not to communicate back to the resident how long it's going to take me to do that. Um, because that's not what they're tasked with, that's not what they've been trained to do. So we're sort of peeling back the layers of what it means to deliver a digital service that is also uh, a physical reality. Part of what we've been doing is also operationalizing UX methods. Uh, some of the things we've done to recruit users is may seem typical to you or may not. Emailing existing users who have registered accounts. Um, we have a permit center where we'll buy free pastries and intercept folks who are waiting for their building permits, which take too long because our city's permitting <laughs> processes are as complicated as San Francisco's. Um, we've also partnered with community organizations to reach residents who aren't as engaged with the city, who aren't likely to show up to City Hall. Um, and we've also been uh, experimenting with a lot of remote, unmoderated testing just because it is so much faster for us to do with such a small team. Uh, some of the challenges in government um, that have been really frustrating to my team but are also kind of like the battle scars of doing user research in government is 
we're not current, no one in our organization is comfortable using public funds to purchase gift cards for user incentives. Um, because uh, if I buy $500 worth of Target cards, how do they know, you know, you have to have really good tracking so that, you know, I didn't just go out and use those Target gift cards myself. So we're doing a pilot using grant funds. Um, but that's an example of something that seems very simple and easy, but that can be hard in government. Um, another one is purchasing software as a service on a credit card. Uh, one of my designers, you know, wanted to transition off her personal InVision account to have a team <laughs> one. <laughs> and, um, you know, our legal and finance staff are like, okay, well, can they, like, agree to our legal terms and can we th pay through a PO? And so if you call up the, in if you, like, get in touch with the customer service staff at InVision and say, can we like pay through PO for like $150 a month? They're, you know, that's not really how they do business. Um, if we were a large enterprise, um, like Airbnb that had a huge enterprise account and was paying tens of thousands of dollars, they probably would sign our legal terms and do a PO with us. But when we're a small team and we're just trying to get going quickly with, um, run-of-the-mill software as a service tools that everyone's using. It's actually like a, a multi-month process for us to figure out how to do that. Um, how we measure progress. I actually think I'm going to outsource. <laughs> Mark is going to talk, I think, about measurement, I hope, and he has a lot of great insights to share on that. Probably the best insight I can offer is there's a woman named Hannah Shank who's done a lot of great research. She's interviewed over 70 government innovators across the U.S. And um, a couple weeks ago, she summed up her uh, thoughts on measuring progress in government innovation where with this, like, if you can get any kind of metrics in place, then you're ahead. <laughs> and <laughs> that was sort of disheartening. Um, one of the things that we found is that um, where we need to start is, is like refining the kinds of questions that we're asking of our users so that we can get better data. So um, in our 311 app, we do have a customer feedback after each transaction that um, used to be much more of a general survey. Um, now we're asking like, well, if you didn't have a good, ex it, you know, we ask them to rate their experience basically on a five point scale. And then if it's a three or worse, we ask what happened. And so now we have some data on like, well, nothing happened. I don't know why my request was closed. It took too long. I need more status updates. I was told to contact another agency. And that granular data uh, will be very helpful to us when we work with the service teams to prioritize and justify the improvements that we're advocating for. We are also starting <laughs> to look at our services on our city's website. Um, and establishing usability standards related to the time it takes a user to complete a task, plain language standards, uh, accessibility standards. Some of these things existed before, some of them didn't. Uh, what we're actually lacking the most is a governance structure to uh, promote and enforce these kinds of standards across the city website. Uh, and one of the ways that we've been doing that, and another way that we are measuring progress is to the extent to which we're training other city staff on user-centered methods. Uh, this is an image from a pilot digital services academy we ran with 20 staff from 12 departments who managed uh, 10 of the top services on the city website. Some of them are digital, some of them are not fully online. Um, and this is where we did work around facilitating those epiphany moments for folks where this one woman who runs our animal care services said, it changed my perspective on what people are thinking when they look at our site. All they want is to get one thing done. And that was a revelation for her because she was thinking she needed to share everything about her wonderful program with, uh, with anyone who came to her site. Um, to end on why this work matters, uh, I think that this is something that the, the why sort of has to, is that, is, depends on the individual of what your why is. Uh, for me, working in government is the, um, is the most fulfilling thing that I found. As, as Kara mentioned in my biography, I tried actually, I was, I've been in other careers. I worked in the private sector in technology and then in urban planning and, um, and local government is just where the mission really feels like a big fit. And I think this idea of like the sublime and the mundane, there's this 
you find the sublime in the mundane because it may seem um, mundane that like one of my achievements in the city of San Jose will be getting the city of San Jose to be okay with buying gift cards to conduct user <laughs> research, right? Like, but that is like seriously awesome. I mean, I would be so stoked if multiple departments had a regular program to use gift cards to, to conduct user research and talk to the people who are using their services. And so it's like, you're working on big hard problems where there can be really simple solutions that take a while to implement, but then once you've done that, the scale of that impact is, is really huge and you kind of know that you're leaving the place better than it was or you're leaving, you've inspired other people who are going to continue to do great work. Um, we are also hiring. I'm hiring a product manager. Um, who's going to be the product manager for a digital, uh, our digital services related to recycling and garbage, which are even more the bread and butter of local government than the, than the 311 services. So please talk to me if you're interested in that. And thank you. <laughs>